Hi, I'm Debbie and welcome to Book and Boo Joe. Thank you so much for joining me today for my October wrap up. To start with, I'm going to open a couple days of my 24 days of tea from Adagio Tea Advent Calendar. So you already saw me open day one, which is reindeer fuel. And this one is delicious. I've actually have a full size bag of this one. It's black tea, ginger, peppermint leaves, toasted mate, which is high in caffeine, as is the black tea, uh, cocoa nibs, natural chocolate flavor. Super yummy. One of my favorites, especially for the holiday season. That peppermint is just so refreshing. I love it. All right, so let's go down to day number two. Excuse my nails, I have not gotten them fixed yet. Uh, so day number two, we have, let me pull it out here. We have pumpkin spice. This one is one of my husband's favorites. So it's got black tea, cinnamon, ginger, cloves, natural pumpkin spice flavor, cardamom, and marigold flowers. So hubby does like that one, and it is a good pumpkin spice flavor. All right, so this is going up on December 4th, so we'll open four of the days. So you'll get to see up to date anyway. So day number three. What do we have? We have cranberry cream. I do have an allergy to cranberries, so I will not be trying this one, but let's see what's in it. We have green rooibos tea, cinnamon, apple pieces, hibiscus, cranberries, rose hips, natural cranberry flavor, and natural cream flavor with red peppercorns. So this one is a caffeine free one. So this is one that I can actually give to my aunt who is not able to have caffeine. So I think she would definitely enjoy this one. So it will definitely get consumed. All right. Day number four is right down here. And this one is cherry marzipan oolong. So I have had this one before and I have actually already opened it. I'm drinking a glass <laughs> right now. So it's pretty much what I remember it from last year. It has, it's an oolong tea. It's got cinnamon, apple pieces for sweetness, uh, rose hips, natural wild cherry flavor, natural almond flavor, cherries, and rose petals, moderate caffeine. So what I remember from last year and what I'm tasting from today, you don't get a whole lot of almond flavor in there at all. Um, for the marzipan taste, I don't get that at all. I get hints of the oolong, but mainly it just tastes like I'm drinking warm cherry Kool-Aid. So if you love cherry Kool-Aid, this one is for you. I'm not the biggest fan of Kool-Aid, so I'm fine drinking it when I, when I get a little sample pack, but it's definitely not one I would purchase. Okay, well let's just do a one more day just because. So we have day five right here. And I have not opened this one yet. Wow. Ah. Yeah, so this one here that I'm looking at is actually from day 14, which I also opened in the unboxing of this advent calendar. So that's what is peeking through there. Okay, so day number five, we have Always Nuts. And I think we had, I had this one last year and I thought it was okay. So I'm, if there's rose or hibiscus in the tea, I tend not to like it very much because I'm not a huge fan of those flavors, which the cherry marzipan one does have some rose in it. Uh, but the ingredients are apple pieces, cinnamon, rose hips, cocoa nibs, hibiscus, natural almond flavor, natural creme brulee flavor. So this might be one that I give to my mother-in-law because she loves creme brulee. So that may be another gifting one. But that's what's fun about these calendars is just having calendars in general. A lot of times you'll get things you would never have tried before. And even if you don't like it, it's still a fun experience to try something new. And you also find some new favorites like the reindeer fuel. So good. One of my favorites. 
So enough with the advent calendar. Let's get on to my wrap up. So I will put together my, I will probably do September through December stats all in one, and that will probably come out at the beginning of January once I've finished reading in December. <laughs> So I won't be doing my stats, but I will be going over the 21 books that I read in October. So here we go. All right, so things are a little different with my shelves. This side's empty. So we wanted to get some electrical into this section of the shelves. So I didn't have cords hanging down the front of it. So we had to take this bookshelf out and put in the electrical and then put it back in. So it's back in, but we still need to seal in between the two shelves so that they are more secure. And then I could put my big pile of books back on. Let me see if I can show you my big pile of books down here. <laughs> big pile of what was on those shelves, yeah. So we have a little cozy nighttime setting. We're also putting some lights, kind of fairy light kind of things up on top of the wall bed and the bookcase. And so once that is done, I can give you a little tour of that. And when I restock my shelves <laughs> from what's on the floor. But anyway, I read 23 books in October and uh, let's, let's go through them. All right. Book number one, no particular order, but the first one I'm going to talk about is Starbinder by Mark Timoney. This is the prequel novella to the Eye of Eternity series. And the first book, is, full novel, is uh, The Blood and the Spear. So this is a fast-paced, action-packed series that follows a young girl that is the hope of, see if I can get this name right, the Shalloway Starbinder. One of my favorite things about this book was Mark Timoney's world building. And so it is a novella, so it is, it's fairly short, but the world building felt very expansive and atmospheric. Even though this book was fast paced, you didn't lose any of the substance of the story. I love that. Book number two, Lord of Chaos, which is the sixth book in the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. And I have to say, I think this is my favorite book so far. It was thrilling, it had a lot of action in it, and it continues to build up the characters and build upon where they were in the previous books and continue with that character building and the growth and the bonding of all of the different characters that they interact with. Monumental ending. All right, next up, Feet of Clay by Terry Pratchett. And this is the 19th book in the Discworld series. A werewolf, a dwarf, and a golem all walk down the city streets in Ankh Morpork. Thought it was a joke, huh? Seriously though, the book was so much fun. We follow Commander Vimes, of course, the commander of the City Watch, as he figures out the who and the how of the crime that he is investigating. I think this was a great spoopy book to have for the spooky season of October. It was full of fun and mystery without being overly scary, which I appreciate. And I love how Terry Pratchett can combine humor and philosophical musings uh, and create a nice balanced experience for the reader. And of course, we have to follow up Feet of Clay with Hogfather, which is the 20th book in the Discworld series by Terry Pratchett. And of course, this is all about the holiday season, festive and fun filled with humor and mystery and great characters. Of course, some of my favorites are in there. Gotta love Death's character. I love the cameos he has in the majority of the books. Super fun. Do you believe in the Hogfather? Or do you not? Some do, some don't. But what would happen if no one believed? Would he still exist? I mean, who needs the night before Christmas when you can read Hogfather instead? All right, next up is Primitive by Mark DeKynan. And for some reason, my Kindle copy does not have the cover of the book. So I will put the cover of the book up here while I talk about it. So I had a lot of mixed feelings about this book. The story starts with a model being kidnapped by a survivalist group that wants to use her to get the word out about uh, environmental issues and see, hoping that this would 
be a way a catalyst to get people to change how they treat the environment and make some actual lasting changes so i did think the story was interesting enough to finish it uh, i thought some of the characters were interesting and um, fleshed out fairly well you actually got to kind of know who they were but overall the story was a little far-fetched it was had some parts that were a little out there like the release of all these all this methane gas is going to bring back the dinosaurs like there were some things that were just like hmm not sure about that <laughs> but of course i do not know i'm not a scientist so i do not know the science behind all of these things it could be accurate it may not be i don't know i can't speak to that it just sounded a little far-fetched for me i also felt that at times the author was pushing an agenda like i felt like i was being preached at a little bit which is fine but i was reading more for entertainment and not to be judged so and do with it what you would like <laughs> there are many 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 trigger warnings for this book so make sure that you go into it uh look having looked at those if there are if you know you have some triggers so lots of triggers there's lots of death there's um hints of abuse and other things like that there's there's just there's a lot in here check those out next up was the library of the dead by tl huchu and this is a gothic horror where roba the main character can speak to the dead so she makes her living off of the dead basically she delivers messages from the dead to their living family and also finds the the living families may have questions that then she asks of the dead and either way she gets some form of payment from the families that are still living of course now while speaking to the dead ropa finds herself stumbling into a mystery that leads her on an adventure she will never forget now the ending I feel was a bit predictable, but I was okay with that because I enjoyed getting there. So even though I, I kind of guessed what was going to happen, I wasn't mad about that because it I, I feel like it felt more good to be like, ooh, I guessed it, <laughs> as opposed to, eh, yeah, got it. I already knew that. So I enjoyed that aspect of it. So I feel like the story was worth it even if you guessed the ending. Next up, I read The Heroes by Joe Abercrombie, which is the sixth seventh book in the first law world or the third standalone book and this one is basically a three day battle so the entire book covers only those three days but you get different perspectives from each of the different people that are battling each other in the different groups you know the union the northmen all of the, our favorite characters you may think it would be repetitive getting similar stories or stories from all the different groups about the exact same thing, but they all have totally different perspectives and were in different areas when that particular event happened. And so it wasn't super repetitive and there was some insights from each person's perspective, which I found kind of interesting. Yeah, so each of the perspectives was engaging and it brought something new to the story. I did enjoy it. All right, so next up was probably my favorite book of the month. It was definitely my favorite book of the series, and that is Act Your Age, Eve Brown by Talia Hibbert, and it is the third book in the Brown Sisters trilogy. And I think one of the reasons I liked it so much is because I could relate to Eve so much more than I could to Chloe or Danny. I've always been into music and into cooking and baking and all of that. I'm also... I. I was also a very spastic child, so I could not focus on anything. I was able to relate to Eve Brown quite a bit, and I loved that they had the reps that they did in this story. I just thought it was done really well, and it was beautiful. The romance was believable between Eve and Jacob, and I loved all the side characters. They were so much fun, so Jacob's friend and his the friend's twin sisters, and it was just so much fun all around. I loved the dynamics between the characters, the interactions, and kind of that somewhat enemies to lovers in there. It was just so much fun. The writing style was super easy to read. It was very well written and just had me laughing out loud. Thoroughly enjoyed it, start to finish. I would probably purchase just 
this one book of the series just to reread it again and again and again because it, I enjoyed it so much and the audiobook was great. Love it. Highly, highly, highly recommend. The next book was, I would say, a little over my head. Not too bad, like I, I understood it, but it was, it doesn't apply as much to my life, I think. I think, so the book was for the JNR Book Club with Jashi Curran, and the book is How to Take Smart Notes by Sanka Ahrens. And I feel that this book is mainly for students, especially like PhD type students, um, or even masters or researchers, so especially in the research field, if you want to publish papers, uh, writers, journalists, that type of student and professional. I just think that just the regular person on the street would get something out of this, but it wouldn't apply to their life quite as much as it would to that other group, you know, writers and researchers and higher education students. I do think if I had read this when I was a student, it would have helped me out a lot, although I'm, it would have really gone over my head at that point in time because, again, couldn't focus, and so <laughs> I don't know if I would have been able to pay attention enough to put this into practice, but it is very good information. It was uh, very easy to read. The writing style was great, and I am glad that I got to read it for the book club, and if you want to check out my Goodreads, I will leave the link down below. I will have a little bit longer review for you on that. So next up is The Chain of Thorns, which is the third and final book in the Last Hours trilogy by Cassandra Clare. And she did not disappoint with this one. There was a lot of action, character building, and it provides a very satisfying conclusion to not only the story, but also to the trilogy itself. Although I do have to say, I still like the side characters a little bit more than the main characters now. Don't get me wrong, I did love the main characters. I do like Cordelia and James, but... Anna and Matt and Lucy. Like, how can you not like that whole gang? Like, Thomas, Alistair, all the side characters, I think, are just as important as the main characters in this particular trilogy. Although, overall, I tend to like the side characters a little bit more in her stories. Like, I always liked Isabel and Simon more than Jason Clary. But let's move on. <laughs> so next up was Holy Sister, and this is the third and final book in the Book of the Ancestor by Mark Lawrence. So go me. I finished three different series this in October, which is awesome. <laughs> Pat on the back for me for that one. <laughs> I was very excited for that. And I, I continued series as well. I, I started some, but I continued and I smashed three different series out. So very happy about that. So I did think Holy Sister was the best book in the series. I loved how everything came together from all the plot points and storylines and characters and everything came together from the first two books and had a nice conclusion into this one. I liked watching all the storylines kind of converge and come together to a big finale. I also enjoyed watching Nona Gray grow throughout the series. As she grew older, she also had character growth and character building and bonding with other characters, and I loved to see that. Next up was another favorite of the month, and that was Grip, which is the second book in the Slip series by David Estes. So this is another series that I actually continued with, and I think it was even better than the first book. So I think he's learning and growing as he writes each of his book, all the books, although um, this series is actually fairly old at this point now. He's got a couple of much newer series out now. But I don't think I have read a David Estes book that I haven't liked. So I think this is the 10th book of his that I've read. The Fate Mark series was actually the first series that I read, and that's a five book series that has um, three books of novellas that go along with it. But the the novellas are, they're compl it's like the origins, one, two, and three. And in each of those origins books, you get little novellas or short stories on each of the different characters so you get their backstory which was really awesome so those are each like 500 and some odd pages as well so they're pretty long but that whole series is amazing so it's there are five main books and then you have three kind of novella-esque books that go along with them and then the first two of the Slip series. So I'm, I still need to get to Flip, which is the final one, so I can finish that one, but that'll probably end up being in the 
early 2025 when they get to that one. But we are continuing to follow Benson and his family from the first book as they try not only to protect Benson, but all of the slips that are out there in the world. So this is a sci-fi dystopian and the world is much smaller than it used to be. So like California is broken off and is in the sea and the eastern seaboard is pretty much gone. So everyone's kind of living in the middle of the United States and there aren't enough resources to go around for everyone. So they have PopCon, which is population control and you have to get permission from them to have a child. And there's basically a drawing. So once someone dies, then first person on the list then gets the opportunity to have a child. If someone else dies, then somebody else gets that opportunity and so on and so forth. And then slips are children who have been born without permission. So either the parents had twins and so one was allowed and the other one not. Uh, maybe they just happened to have another child. It was an oops or whatever. These slips are then hunted down and um, say disposed of. So pretty much they kill the slips and get rid of them. So that it's not a drain on their resources. But is there really not enough resources to go around? You're gonna have to read Grip to find out. So in Grip we're also, we follow a lot of the same characters from the first book, which is nice so we get to learn more about them, but we also are introduced to some new characters which are pretty awesome and I look forward to seeing where all of them end up in the final book. Next up, I read Yumi and the Nightmare Painter by Brandon Sanderson, and this is the third book in The Secret Projects from 2020, and I enjoyed it. I, I did really like it. Um, I felt it was might have been a little long or the pace was a little slow. Not sure if it's a combination of the two or one or the other, but I felt like it could have been a little shorter Maybe some scenes were dragged out a little bit more than they needed to be, but overall I really liked it. I gave it four stars. So Yumi and the painter come from two different worlds. Not literally, but from two different areas on the same world. We'll say that. <laughs> and they have now somewhat come together and they need to learn how to work together to defeat the nightmares that are taking over and plaguing both their worlds in some way or another. I really did like the characters and I liked getting to know them as, or watching them as they got to know each other. I also liked watching the, or reading about their the character growth throughout the book, as well as just watching them grow as people. The magic system I think is really interesting, especially the whole Nightmare Painter side was really fun. But again, I do felt feel like it was just a little bit long. And then continuing on with Brandon Sanderson, I also did a reread of Mistborn Era 1, The Final Empire, and that was, again, a five-star read. I still thoroughly enjoyed it, and I am looking forward to finishing uh, The Well of Ascension and Their Hero of Ages by the end of the year. And then I also read The Sunlit Man, which was the secret project number four, and I do have to say I really like this one. So I think Tress of the Emerald Sea was probably my favorite, and then The Sunlit Man, and I did actually really enjoy the Frugal Wizard's Handbook to Medieval, medieval England, but I had heard so many people's disappointment about that book, so my expectations were super low. If you go into it knowing it's written for adults, but more as a, like a middle grade book for adults, middle grade book for adults, if that makes any sense, it's much more enjoyable. So just think of it as middle grade, you'll enjoy it more. <laughs> but The Sunlit Man, we're back in the Cosmere. So You Mean the Nightmare Painter is also takes place in the Cosmere and it is narrated by Hoyd, which was fun. And then The Sunlit Man, is also part of the Cosmere, and you'll recognize a lot more of the names. The main character is also in the Stormlight Archive, so that is fun. So you'll you'll enjoy this one. He as especially since Brandon Sanderson is back to his fantasy roots, which is really where he shines. But I, I love that he's branching out and trying new things and trying to grow as an author because I think just think that's great. And then moving on to a Lee Bardugo book, I read The Language of Thorns, and this is an anthology of fairy tales from the Grishaverse, and it's children's fairy tales. So these are tales that would be told to the children of the Grisha and the Zemeni and the Fjordans and all of them. <laughs> 
So I thought it was very creative and very interesting. I don't necessarily think it's a must read for the Grishaverse universe. I don't think you need to read it to understand anything else in any of the main books and I don't think it necessarily adds to it overall but some of these stories are mentioned in the main series so it's kind of fun to know what the story is and give you a little bit of context. So the artwork is amazing. Sarah Kippen is the artist that did all of the illustrations and it's a progressive illustration that goes throughout each story. So like on page one, there's like one thing on there and then page two, that one's there, but there's something added to it. Page three, something else added. Page four, something else added. So each time you turn a page, there's something new on that page that's being added to the whole general picture that's going to show up. So by the end of the story, you have this beautiful outline around or border around the whole page of the stories and it's is just beautiful and I think it just adds so much to the story itself because the artwork's all about the stuff that's happening in the story and it's illustrated there for you and it, it just added so much to the atmosphere and everything for the story. I, I bumped it up a full star just for the artwork. So next up is The Vampire A Tale and this is by John William Polidori. Polidori. I thought this story was so atmospheric, like you get that, that gothic horror feel to it. And it's a short yet haunting tale that was actually fairly easy to read, especially for a classic. The atmosphere sets this wonderfully gothic mood and the subtlety of the plot is engaging. Not necessarily the best writing style in terms of prose, it's the mo not the most elegant or flowery or any of that but the story itself is very engaging and worth the read. And the story behind the book itself is actually quite interesting. So you had Mary Shelley and Lord Byron and John William Polidar, Polidori, and there's they're all friends and they've kind of gotten together and they decide to have this competition. They all had to write a short story and then the win who would be the winner? Kind of a roundabout way to say that. <laughs> so, but the winner, so not surprisingly, was actually Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, which I thought was quite interesting. And John William Polidori it was actually friends with Lord Byron Shelley, and uh, it was his doctor, and they became friends. And he submitted this story, and it was very fun. If you can find an audiobook of this one from someone who reads really well, it's very entertaining and very it just lends so much to the atmosphere the one if i can find the one i read i will try and link it below i found it on youtube so if i find it i'll leave it linked below um but he did such an amazing job on that one and yeah highly recommend reading it so i had my kindle copy up at the same time and it was so good this next book ended up being probably my second favorite of the month just barely behind actor age eve brown and then grip came in just behind that and that is the haunting of elmwood manor and that is by pamela mccord and i loved this book it was so enjoyable so this one is a spoopy book so that is a spooky season book that is not scary so it kind of sets you in the atmosphere with the Halloween season, but without making you scared and your adrenaline go and stress you out and whatever else. So this was just super fun. It's a middle grade book. So the main character is Pekin Dulap, and of course she knows all of the Peking duck jokes because her name is Pekin, but without the G. And then her two best friends, they're all in high school, but Pekin can, can see ghosts. So apparently this is something her mom was able to do as a kid as well. And she has decided she's going to start a Ghostbusters kind of business. So her first client owns Elmwood Manor and she would like to sell this house, but she can't because it's haunted and she needs someone to get rid of the ghost so she can sell this house. I enjoyed the characters and their dynamics together. Of course, they're high schoolers, so you have that kind of dynamic going on just as three kids in high school. 
yet it is written more for middle graders. And the atmosphere is so good. It puts you right in that kind of spoopy mood. Although there is some scary parts in the book, like scary, they're not like horror movie kind of scary, but they can be a little, make you a little nervous. And there are a couple of trigger warnings in here for abuse. So just be aware of that before you go into it. But I would highly recommend this to any middle grader and even a young adult that just wants a fun, quick and easy read that's highly entertaining. I gave it five stars. So next up was actually more of a spooky book and more of a witchy book, but puts you in the mood for the Halloween season. And that is Slewfoot by Brahm. Now I read Krampus a couple years ago by Brahm and I loved that. That was one of my favorite Christmas stories that I read that year. And so I was very excited to find Slewfoot and give that one a try. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. It is a tale of magic and mystery full of the atmosphere that only Brahm can write. So we're set in colonial England and this is the time of the Puritans. We meet Abatha who is betrothed to a stranger in this Puritan colony. And she finds herself even more alone now in this pious community when her husband dies and she is left a widower. And she now must try and make, make it on her own. And she's fighting for any small bit of freedom that she can get in this community who doesn't really want her there. And she doesn't want to lose who she is and try and fit in just for the sake of fitting in. So she wants to be who she is and try and take as much freedom as she can to be able to stay who she truly is as a person. Slewfoot is a powerful spirit that has lost his identity. He's not really sure who he is anymore. And as he's trying to find who he is, him and Abatha find each other. And she is, as she is trying to stay who she is and find her place in the world. And together they do what they must so that they can survive in this world that is intent on killing their spirit. Truly, the atmosphere in this book was amazing. So good. Definitely trigger warnings again. <laughs> of course, it's the Halloween spooky season. There's always going to be trigger warnings. All right, getting close to the end. The last four books, which are all basically... Think of them as cheesy 80s slasher movies <laughs> in book form. <laughs> were so much fun. These ones are all spooky books that of course are more like the 80s horror movies like Halloween and Friday the 13th and those kind of slasher movies. Scream from the 90s. That kind of style. So the cover on this book is just scary in and of itself but <laughs> we start with The Christmas Morning Massacre and this is by Nasser Robdi. Robdi Rabadi. Nasser Rabadi, and it is the Ravenhill Butcher book one. So in this one we follow a brother and sister who are staying at their family's kind of vacation home and the sister is having a bunch of friends from college over to spend the, the Christmas holiday together. Basically just drinking, watching movies, listening to music, partying, that kind of thing with just their small little group. Well, the first day there's this huge blizzard and they are now snowed into the house which of course is fine if they're just going to be drinking and watching movies not a big deal but they did notice that on the first day that the back door was open and there was these like wet footprints going through part of the house and they were like oh it must just be the brother he had to go get something out of the car or whatever he just forgot to close the front door or the back door so well <laughs> let's just say it wasn't the brother Will any of them survive? It's a good question. It was highly entertaining, cheesy, but interesting. <laughs> Atmospheric. Definitely had an atmosphere all its own and the nice uh, scare factor like, don't go in the basement, why are you going in the basement? You know, when you yell at the movies and you're, you're like, don't do that, he's down there. That's the feel of this book as well. It was, it was great. You gotta love finding those random free Kindle books that end up being highly entertaining. <laughs> and then of course I had to follow it up with the Raven Hill Butcher book two. And this one is set in the eighties and that is Return to Camp Solgahatchia and again by Nasser Rabadi. And again, <laughs> it's the great slasher movies. Uh. It's past my bedtime. 
let's keep going. <laughs> Getting sleepy. It's all good. So again, set in the 1980s, and we are following a group of kids that are heading back to Camp Sulcahatchia for one last time before they graduate from high school and move on to other things. And of course, it's camp, so the food is bad, but the company is great. So the urban story of the Ravenhill Butcher has been around for a long time, and actually there was a death at this camp way back when, and the camp was closed down for quite a while, but now it's back open to invite all of these kids back. And there are some strict rules where you cannot go out at night, especially by yourself, and you do not go to the cabin that is the edge of the camp. That is off limits, don't go there. And part of this urban legend is that even if you just say the Ravenhall Butcher's name, that he will come back. But what would happen if you went to his cabin and you just knocked on the door? Would he come back? Hmm. Well, you'll have to read this one to find out what happens. And then, of course, since I was reading sequels for all of the slasher 80 horror movie style books, I had to read Clown in a Cornfield number two, Friendo Lives, because I read the first one a couple years ago. Last year? Last year. Two years ago, I think. So I had to finally read the sequel since my library had it on audiobook, and I was very excited to get back into this story, and it was worth it. It's totally cheesy but it is super fun. Definitely part of the whole spooky Halloween atmosphere. And it was just, it was fun. I, yes, it's again, it's got a scary parts. It's definitely got some massacres going on, <laughs> but it, it was just highly entertaining. And that is by Adam Caesar. Last but not least, we have Pumpkin Man. And this is Creepers Landia, and Jane is the main character. And this is by Penny Moons. And Creepers Landia, so each book in the series is kind of a different holiday or different character that you're following. So this one we're following, Jane. And this one I would say is a cutesy spooky book, so it's still total slasher movie style book but it's written in a more cutesy way, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> so the Pumpkin Man character is completely ridiculous and over the top, but in a good way. <laughs> and I was surprised there's actually some character building in this book. You actually get to know some of the characters fairly well and you kind of care about what's gonna happen to them or you at least wanna, you're interested to see what's going to happen. And you're kind of guessing who is the Pumpkin Man? like. Who is, who, which neighbor might it be, or which person in the community is it? And is it just someone wearing a pumpkin on their head, or is it actually like a, a pumpkin man? Their head really is a pumpkin. <laughs> Even with the character building, that doesn't mean this story is like super in-depth or anything, but it is quite interesting and kept you reading. <laughs> So the main character, Jane, is set to babysit for one of her neighbors for Halloween so that the mom, who is a single mom, can go out and have an enjoyable evening at a party, a little costume party that's happening in the area. And so she spends more time with people her age and have some fun. Now, the Pumpkin Man has terrorized this town on and off for quite a while, and there is one family member that the gentleman is a teacher and he basically lost his entire family, his wife and his kids to the pumpkin man. And he has never quite fully recovered. There's a police officer that was involved with thinking that they got rid of the pumpkin man. And so her character is in here as well. But again, they think they got rid of the pumpkin man, but as they found out this year, they did not, he is back. So there's a couple of characters, like the elderly couple that lives across the street from the place where Jane is babysitting. The wife is awesome. I loved her character. <laughs> Jane is a great character. And the pumpkin man is actually just hilariously over the top, but totally worth reading. I, I just thought this was totally enjoyable. I don't know how many times have I said that. <laughs> It's very fun, outlandish, over the top. Gotta read, gotta read it. 
But again, my top three favorites I've mentioned already a couple of times, but Act Your Age, Eve Brown by Talia Hibbert, The Haunting of Elmwood Manor by Pamela McCord, and Grip by David Estes. I highly recommend all of the books that I read pretty much this this month or for October. I thought they were all very good. I don't think I gave anything lower than a three and a half, which is also very nice. Um, I, I do tend to be a little generous with my ratings. I'm sure some of the ones I rated four stars, others would probably give them three, but I highly enjoyed them and I love going into each book and expecting to just have a great time and trying not to judge it too much. But I do have to have an honorable mention for two actual spooky books, and that is Slewfoot by Brahm and The Vampire, A Tale by John William Polidori for helping to set that spooky mood for the month. And again, the cheesy awards for <laughs> the month definitely go to Clown in a Cornfield 2 and Pumpkin Man. So I am going to do, like I said at the beginning, have all of my stats for Q4, well, September through December all rolled up into one video and I will put that out in January so you'll get to see everything that I read. But I did read, as I said, 23 books in October, so that was pretty good. Not one of my biggest months. I have read over 30 before, but most of those are usually fairly small. These ones um, mainly were all over 250 pages with some of them being closer to 700. So what so. were your favorite spooky season reads? Did you have some good cheesy fun ones? Did you have some good slasher horror movie style books? Did you read actual scary books? Like were you reading Stephen King and some of those styles? Or are you more of a spooky book fan that you like the, the Halloween feel without being scared? And do you not like Halloween stuff at all? And you just read a whole bunch of romances and other random books. <laughs> I'd love to find out. Let me know down in the comments. Thank you so much for joining me. And please like, comment, and subscribe if you want it. And hit that notification bell so you don't miss any videos from me. Leave a pumpkin emoji down in the comments uh, in honor of the cheesiness of the pumpkin man. And until next time, keep reading.